art for a lot of us is a very challenging ordeal, right? The act of creating can be very difficult. Of course, on paper and when we're kids, it's a very easy thing. We just kind of pick up a pencil and some crayons and we draw. But a lot of us, the older we get, we, we tend to put more onto it. We put more into it and it can be a very long and challenging process. And while I do always say anything worthwhile does take time, this long journey, it's easy to become overwhelmed with a lot of negative thoughts and emotions, feelings of uncertainty, this, this uncertainty of what to do next, this disorganization, you know, are we disorganized in our creative process or the projects that we're kind of taking on? And will that all lead, of course, to a lack of motivation and burnout? These feelings that I know I felt as a student and my students now constantly are experiencing lead them to ask a lot of similar questions. The questions I want to address in today's video are, what does a young artist have to do to be seen? And at what point do we stop doing the fundamentals? And what do we focus on next? What do we focus on after those? So if you are an artist and you've experienced some of those, or maybe you're experiencing that now, I think this is going to be a video for you because I'm going to go over a lot of little actionable things to help you stay creative, to keep that passion there and why that's important. And of course, how to avoid creative burnout. I'm Tyler Edlin. I've been an artist and instructor here now for close to 15 years. And before we begin, I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Milano. With that said, let's get into this. So uh, first up today, what does an artist have to do to get noticed? And when the students ask this, I think they aspire to be some sort of professional, whether that's a production artist, maybe a renowned illustrator on a well-known property, something like Magic the Gathering, or maybe they want to work on the next big AAA game. They just want their artwork noticed by someone that's going to propel or start potentially their career. It is 2024 and things are fairly competitive. And on this journey, of course, it is easy to feel loads of self-doubt, uh, to deal with imposter syndrome. These are aspects and videos I've covered more in depthly in other videos, but uh, we got to keep these feelings away. And I know for me personally, and this same thing is actually going to help us get noticed, uh, and that's to kind of reflect on why you started this career or why you started developing your skills to begin with. Reflect back at your beginnings. And for me, I do have to remind myself occasionally why I started this whole endeavor before I ever thought of making it a business, before I ever thought of monetizing it. You know, why did I draw? For me personally, it was, it goes back to the 90s. You know, when I just loved video games. I loved the worlds. I loved the escapism. I loved the characters and the settings and how my imagination filled in the blanks. This is what got me creating. And so that's why in like a video like this, I'm creating these characters. I don't have a huge reputation in this field as, as a character artist. I'm more of an environment guy, but I love creating these characters and I'm not going to redefine the genre with them. I'm, I'm not going to set the world on fire with these characters. First and foremost, I'm creating them for myself. I'm finding enjoyment in them, and it's keeping this creative fuel in me going. And so what's awesome about this passion is it actually has a halo-like effect. It's contagious. I was on a call with a student last week. They had just got off a program at a fairly rigorous and prestigious art school. They wanted to start some new creative endeavors, some new projects. And we got, you know, two weeks into it and I could instantly tell there was too much of this creative friction going on between them and the project. I could see they were not in it. They, they liked the idea of it, but they needed to switch gears because it's very obvious when you're working on something, if you're not fully committed to it and if you're most importantly not enjoying the craft. You're not enjoying the project, whatever the case is. It's very obvious. And so for me, that's that's always my go-to to recommend to students to like stand out, is to take some of that technical aspect out of it, 
figure out what's fun to you and then figure out a way in which you can potentially grow from that. I think you used to be able to stand out a lot more in the past with a high skill cap, but I think things are changing now. I am certainly personally drawn to more art that captures the artist's sense of personality, what, what they prefer. It's giving me an insight, a window into them as a creator. And I am absolutely loving that. So not only is your passion powerful fuel for yourself, but it will help you build and form connections. I know when I'm doing these characters that, I, that I'm working on here today, I, and I can post them. Again, there's far better character artists, there's far better character designers out there. But those that do like it, those that do share it, that are even commented on it, you know, that's already kind of starting to form little bits of connections. And that's what I'm simply recommending here is to look down deep inside, potentially way before you saw and were exposed to this whole industry of artists, figure out what you just like to do. Because if you can find a way to make it fun, then you're going to be able to keep on going. And that's what we're going to get into next is ways to cultivate your creativity while maintaining a certain level of funness and just applying a little bit of structure to that. And that leads us to at what point should I stop learning the fundamentals and what's after that? Well, you never stop <laughs> learning the fundamentals. There's always room for improvement. Let's get at that out of the way. But for me, what I recommend, like once you have a comprehensive understanding of all those major important aspects of perspective, of composition, color and light, shape design, once you have a core understanding of those, now is what I'd like to call a great time for creative play. Grinding endless drills and exercises will only get us so far. And it's an easy trap a lot of creatives fall into where you're essentially just grinding out and forming patterns of mindless work, right? Logging hours for the sake of it or because you heard someone else mention that you should and you don't really know why you're doing this anymore. So as I was saying, creative play, slightly structured, will actually take you on a new leg of your creative journey, no matter what your artistic goal is. There are many new startups and established companies in the market nowadays, and whether your goal is to create a portfolio that attracts potential employers or whether you're developing work to launching your own creative business, projects are the key for achieving this. Every industry, every company has their own set of different standards that they're looking for. It's, this is never a one size fits all. One portfolio may be great for one studio and be very irrelevant to the next. But if anything, 2024 has taught me is that just having a clear understanding of your fundamentals probably will not be enough to make you stand out and to land you that job you're seeking. So with a project, you really want to express your own inner creative voice, what your passion is, right? What your interests are and what of course you're good at. This will of course help you avoid the trap of having that student looking portfolio where you have essentially one of everything that you ever created. One of each exercise, one of each study, one environment, one character, one prop design, one interior, right? That's a very obvious student portfolio trap we want to avoid. So personal projects are going to be your key to victory here. So and ideally with, with a personal project, you're going to be using it to foster a new skill to supplement your existing one or personal projects are great at playing up and fine tuning your strengths, either or. And so this is where the sponsor of today's video, Milanote, comes in. Well, if you've never heard of it, Milanote is a tool for organizing any kind of visual projects. Whether you're a filmmaker, interior designer, graphic designer, visual illustrator, or even concept artist, there's built-in pre-made templates for all kinds of uses. So for example, I'm using it in a variety of ways. This is my kind of homepage. It's just the startup and go to, and I have a little basic calendar set up. I like to kind of project three days in advance. I put a very big kind of to-do list. These are the things I have to get done. And I also have my projects and my students are using it as well because 
Melanote has a lot of built-in collaborative features. So uh, my student Nazarin, for example, is going to start a new project and she wants to share her art direction with me. She can make her own little board, set it up, and she can use a combination of images, uh, text, she can visually describe things. I could come in here, I could draw on it, give her notes, leave her feedback, and point you know, my students in a good direction very effortlessly now. I've been using it lately and with these past videos to work on a nice little world building project. And it's perfect for visual thinkers like me because it allows me to organize my ideas in a way that just makes sense for me. Again, loads of drag and drop features. So again, if I need to create a new sub board, I can just literally grab the board option, drag and drop like we can kind of see here. And now I can go in and organize the ideas within there. And that's what students are always asking. You know, how do I start a new project? I've already kind of answered when to, and that's after your fundamentals. Start a project just by jumping in and outlining a very few specific and clear goals. You know, whether you are working on one of your weaknesses, like I am, I'm filling in my, my character design. So here's my character board. And every one that I finish, I'm just, you know, dragging and dropping and pasting into here. And then, of course, I can come in and add a little bit of flavor text, or if I need to make notes, I can, I can use arrows and kind of point and connect things. And I can make a whole clan rivalry chart board, or I can make a family tree, you know, to some of these characters if I wanted. It, it makes it so fast and fun. If you've got a detailed plan out in terms of what you want to do, like for me, what could I do with a project like this? I could come up with some stickers, I could make an art book, I could do a series of illustrated short stories. Maybe long term I could make some resin figures, a board game, a video game, or design like a poster card set. That could be fun. Uh, I could make it into a whole art business. Now, if I, if I am early in production like I am, one thing I love to do, of course, earlier in a project development, I recommend this for everyone, is to make a simple mood board. This is what's going to keep me inspired through the late nights. What's super cool about Milanote is that I can use a combination of texts, imagery, and even videos, right? Like I have Chrono Cross's title screen just playing here on loop because I love it. I saw it in 1999. It inspired me then. It's inspired me as a full-grown adult now. Just love the game. Love the setting and the world. So like, let's say I do have a distant idea to maybe make some of these character designs that I've been working on as like a sticker or something. And I wanted to start formulating my ideas. Like I said, I could go into the board. If I see an idea right now on, on Pinterest or on art station or even in the Kara app, I could go in and just grab it, right? Like, let's just say I love this Ghibli texture. What if this Ghibli texture is a <laughs> sticker idea? I could simply just copy paste it. I have it here. I could drag and drop. It forms it to one of my uh, templates. And I didn't even start this from scratch, this new sticker board idea. I'll show you kind of how I'm doing this. Milanote's got a lot of built-in pre-made templates. So you can start with something like this and you basically can go in and then just fill in the blanks for what your idea is. Again, there's something for everyone. There's hundreds of these templates. So right, if I use this, it's gonna clear it and now I can hit the ground running essentially with my ideas. It's simply saving me a lot of time when it comes to organizing these creative ideas. Also, I did forget to mention, there is a built-in app for it which integrates right in, so if you're away from your screen or your computer, I can simply continue to add to it. And Milanote also has built-in uh, extensions and plugins like their Web Clipper that makes this process even easier. So of course Milanote is free with no sort of time limits or restrictions. You can sign up using the link in my description. It does help the channel out. I would appreciate it. And let me know if you're going to build a project, if you're currently building a project, or maybe if you think Milano might help you organize your ideas. So like, for example, here's a lot of the environments that I've already kind of fleshed out for this setting and this world. And it's just going to keep ballooning out because as a creator, I know this kind of happens. I come in with the intent of having a small kind of controlled idea. And the more I think, the more I create, the more it just kind of keeps going. So if it's not obvious already, I do feel projects are extremely important when it comes to an artist's development and creative growth. I do think they're really fun and of course sustainable. If you scale and plan them accordingly, anyone can start a project and of course you can scale it to your own skill level and time commitment. You can have short-term projects, you can have long-term projects. And I'd recommend just starting to build and craft out an easier one using an app like Milanote 
as soon as you have a comprehensive understanding of the fundamentals. Again, not a mastery. So in this last segment, I just wanna circle back and talk more about stimulating creative growth while avoiding creative burnout. It is very easy to get lost in the daily pursuit of maintaining social relationships, chasing down clients, getting lost in our own deadlines, and the complexities of our very own projects. So one of the first things you can do, and like what my student AJ Yama is doing, is aligning your project with your passion. Typically, AJ is working on a lot of uh, female characters, a lot of sci-fi settings, and figure-based illustrations. So he wanted to do a project that will help him grow as an artist, a creator, and a designer, but that also kind of carries through some of his interests. So what he's working on is a, a basically a sci-fi mech factory. It's a small enough self-contained project that's just outside his comfort zone, and that's what really stimulates the growth. So whenever you're in doubt and, and not sure what to work on, simply just choose something you love and then just go slightly outside that. So as you could see, what part of what he's doing too is making this process enjoyable for himself. And so while he's not doing a crazy city design or a massive sequence of illustration, and as you can see, he's starting out very simply and progressively overloading the complexity in which he's adding and subdividing and, and bringing that design into finalization. And this is a pretty standard design process that he can then apply to all his future endeavors. That's the takeaway. And part of that is setting his own creative restraints. Having creative restraints within a project and your own personal projects is absolutely key to growing. Because if you can do anything and any time, it's just too much. And this is what I mean by like, he's playing, but there's a little bit of structure to it. So I'm saying, okay, if you want to design a mech factory, let's add some actual human scale elements that have some functionality to them so that it doesn't look like a bunch of random blocky sci-fi shapes that are existing for the sake of it because this is what we perceive sci-fi to be so for example he's designing specific refueling stations he's working on a retractable launch ramp you know that's going to shoot out the mechs and of course he's designing all the big industrial doors that'll open and close to facilitate that and he's get really getting into like why the, this layout would work and what's you know specific kind of functionality is going to be utilized within this design right so having creative restraints is the perfect and often just enough of that restrictions that you need to really kind of grow and start to think um, a little bit outside what you traditionally kind of do and i kind of simplify this whole process personally by breaking things down into like four kind of key phases which i've on screen now and I'll, sh I'll show you I'll, and I'll walk you through how a, a different student of mine Christina is doing this but essentially breaking things down into smaller manageable tasks is the key to success and keeping it sustainable so phase one outlining what you need to do it, it is your project outline and then phase two is your reference gathering your art direction and then phase three and this is where a large part of a lot of my design courses take place is in phase three just kind of drawing and coming up with the ideation aspect of what your idea is these can be very loose they can, they can be a little tighter if you want them to look nice and then of course phase four is just bringing it all together into like a nice kind of presentational sort of image a fancier illustration that could appeal to non-artisan designers it's the detailing and it takes a long time to do and one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of my uh, students tend to make is they want to jump into phase four without going through phases one through three on a given project. And that's what's often troublesome. So as you can see in phase one and two here for what my student this last term is doing, Christina, she's outlining exactly what she needs to do to kind of creatively solve. She's getting not an abundance of reference, but just enough reference to help start that project right to ignite that creative passion that's going to get her drawing it doesn't have to be the most accurate drawings they don't have to be the prettiest drawings but they're functional drawings and once you kind of can follow this whole process that i'm outlining here the key is that it can get you into a flow state and when you can pair flow states and projects together that's when you know we as creators generally are going to be the most productive and we're going to feel the most satisfaction during that whole process constantly keeping us coming back to create more and more. So when Christine is kind of moving into a project like this, of course, if you're entering flow state, 
your problem solving skills get a little bit sharper and of course you get enhanced productivity like I said. Another way to kind of keep aspects of this is like you could keep it fun. Christine is doing this in one of my classes so she can bounce her ideas off of me. She can bounce these ideas off her students. And of course, she could just do something simple too, like sharing it online with her own uh, social circles and followers. So that's another little hack to keep your projects fun is to incorporate some sort of social aspect into your process. And as you can see, she's refining in, in phase three, working out a little bit more solid versions of our ideas and she's bringing them together uh, and figuring out how she wants to stylistically render them in phase four, bringing it all to kind of together with one example of the room. And she could do this with any of her ideas, but it's a nice simple process. It's making it manageable for her. So of course she's gonna get a little more enjoyment and uh, satisfaction from following that process. Now, one thing that I, I personally do to kind of keep myself from avoiding burnout is to juggle multiple kinds of projects. And maybe with this, the correct wording is even juggling multiple disciplines. So they don't all have to be art projects specifically. Basically, I try to find that sweet spot where I'm taking on just enough so that I'm not constantly overwhelmed. I'm still overwhelmed, just like anybody else on the given day. But, I, you know, I, it's just enough that I can manage it. And it keeps it exciting and it, and it keeps me kind of moving so I don't kind of stagnate too much in any one area. The ability as a creator... Um, to walk away from something when you need a break is really the key to sustainability. If I try to force something, you know, when I'm drawing these characters here and I'm, and I'm loving this, but if, if I need a break, I'm going to just put these things down so I can get a fresh perspective when I come back. And of course, I can keep creating and working in a, in a productive way into something else. So for example, I have different kinds of projects. One of them are my house projects. These are things that I tend to daily. I'm trying to constantly improve my lawn. I'm working on the design of the perimeter of my property, which is fencing, it's edging, it's certain specific types of gardens that that's going to entail, right? There's a lot of effort that I'm putting into there and it's keeping me moving, which leads me to my next project. Like my physical fitness is a huge project. It's a long-term project that I'm investing in, but it's something I'm constantly thinking of and trying to improve for my time put in. And then, of course, I'm working on like my character designs and my environment design course. There's a lots of little moving pieces. And then that way, on any kind of given day, uh, I can kind of just switch gears and put what I need to on my plate. So I'm never constantly just burning out from trying one thing too many times. That's how I do it. And that's how I made it sustainable for the last 15 years. But guys, if you haven't worked on a personal project lately... Uh, I'm going to put out a, a brief little outline. It's not going to tell you what kind of project to do, but it's going to outline the steps that you could take so you could start putting one into practice. That's going to be in a mailer probably in a, in, a, in a week or so. So there's links below to sign up for that, as well as mill a note if you guys want to start to organize your outline in a very visual way. So I'm going to give you basically two free resources for those interested. The worst thing that we can do is to not act or start a lot of our ideas. And it, I saw a quote recently by Mark Twain. And so he said in 20 years, we're going to be more disappointed by the things that we didn't do than the things that we did. And, you know, he's right. You know, all of our time here on earth is limited. I, I hit 40 this year and it's like, yeah, you know what? I just want to constantly make sure I'm getting the things done that I need to. So, you know, I'm just starting all kinds of projects. I don't even care if, if they work out or if they ever amount to anything. I'm enjoying kind of creating them. And I do feel like I'm getting some growth from them as well. And then hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm not going to regret not just starting all these little ideas that I have in my head. So again, I'd like to thank Millinote for sponsoring this video and help keeping my ideas organized. Guys, let me know below what you think. And if, of course, you have any projects that you want to start this year.